Welcome to Lecture 28, whose subject is electric charge. More importantly, welcome to Section 4 of the course. Uh, Section 4 will occupy us from Lecture 28 through Lecture 40, and Section 4's topic is electromagnetism. Why are we spending so much of the course on electromagnetism? Because electromagnetism, as you saw back in Lecture 7, is an aspect of one of the three fundamental forces that make up the universe that govern all interactions throughout the universe. And importantly for us human beings, electromagnetism is the force that dominates on scales from roughly the size of the atomic nucleus up to objects of sort of the size of ourselves. Beyond that, gravity begins to become more important. As I stand here, for example, how come my arms don't fall off because they're being pulled down, after all, by the force of gravity? They don't fall off because electrical forces in my body are holding me together. Electrical forces bind atoms into molecules, molecules into biological tissues and other substances that we deal with. Electromagnetic technology is at the basis of most of what we do from things like giant motors that run subway trains to the uh, tiny nano-electronic scale objects that are the memories of our computers, uh, that run our wireless networks, that run our uh, cell phones, our televisions. Everything these days we deal with is basically based on electromagnetic technology. So electromagnetism is very important and we're going to be dealing with electromagnetism again from now until Lecture 40. Let me begin, before I get into the subject matter of this particular lecture, with a brief history of electromagnetism, and it's going to be very brief. I'm going to end it in the 19th century, which is where our modern-day understanding of electromagnetism actually pretty much ends in a theoretical way, and yet electromagnetism uh, has become a very, very contemporary topic, as I suggested with many of the examples I just gave you. So let's begin with a brief history of electromagnetism. The ancient Greeks knew about electricity. They didn't know about magnetism as much, but they knew about electricity. And they studied the the, uh, substance amber, which is basically a fossilized kind of pine pitch. It's a very good electrical insulator, and it builds up static electricity easily. Amber in Greek is electron, and that's where the word electricity and electron and all the words associated with electricity come from. The Chinese, at about the same time, also experimented with electromagnetism, but for them it was magnetism, and they developed magnetic compasses. So electricity and magnetism and humankind's understanding of them go back thousands of years. Let's jump forward to about the 18th century. In the 18th century, Benjamin Franklin put forward a model of electricity in which he even envisioned it as a kind of fluid. And he was the first to realize that there were probably two aspects to this fluid or or two kinds of it, what we would call today two different charges. Again, that will be the topic of today's lecture. Uh, Joseph Priestley, better known for the discovery of oxygen and a fascinating character in his own right, and Charles Coulomb in France, Joseph Priestley in England, uh, both quantified the electric force. They understood how to write an equation that described how the electric force between two charges behaved. Uh, Galvani and Volta, at about the same time, developed the first battery, it was 1800, and they uh, studied electric currents, often generated in biological systems at first, famous experiments with frog's legs that you may have heard of. By the time the 19th century came around, people were beginning to understand electricity and magnetism as related things. Um, Orsted, Ampere in particular, determine some of the relationships between electricity and magnetism, relationships that we'll explore throughout this lecture. Michael Faraday discovered the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction, a vastly important phenomenon. We'll have a whole lecture on the discovery and theory of it and another one on practical applications. And finally, James Clerk Maxwell completed our electromagnetic theory in the 1860s, and classical physics version of electromagnetism became complete at that point. And again, this doesn't mean it's ancient history, because we still use electromagnetism today, and it still has many surprises to offer us. So that's a very brief history of electromagnetism. So let's move now to the subject of this lecture, which is one of the most fundamental aspects of electricity and magnetism, namely electric charge. So what is electric charge? Well, it's a fundamental property of matter. What is the nature of this property? Well, it beats me. I can't give you an answer to that question. The reason I can't give you an answer to that question is it's such a fundamental property. It's really a basic aspect. It's not like something that you grab a can of electric charge and you paint it on a particle and you make it into an electron, for example. Electric charge is a fundamental property of some of the most basic particles of matter. Let me give you an example to show you uh, why it is that I can't tell you what electric charge is, because there's another more familiar property of matter that I also can't tell you what it is, and that's mass. 
I don't really know what mass is. I can come up with all kinds of fancy physics definitions, none of them entirely satisfactory. The reason I understand mass is because I deal with it in my everyday life. Ugh, pick up the massive bowling ball. I heft it. That gives me my gut feel for what mass is. I don't care about equations. I don't care about force equals mg. I don't care about, oh, maybe it's associated with the number of molecules in here or number of atoms or something, or the amount of matter or some complicated relativistic definition. I know mass because I've dealt with it enough in my life. That bowling ball is more massive than that softball, and I understand mass in that sense. And that's the sense in which I, as a physicist, understand electric charge. Electric charge is just a bit less familiar to you, probably, so you don't feel as familiar with it as you do with mass. But electric charge is one of the most truly fundamental properties of matter. It's not some accessory. It's built right into the heart of some of the most fundamental particles. There are two kinds of electric charge, as Benjamin Franklin suggested. They're called positive and negative. Neither one is a presence or absence of something. So in a sense, those terms are misleading. On the other hand, they're useful mathematically, as we'll see. You know probably that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And in a few minutes, I'll give you a demonstration of that. Electric charge is a conserved quantity. If you have a closed region, the total amount of electric charge in that region can never change. And it's even more conserved than mass. The net charge in a closed region won't change. The amount of mass in a closed region actually can change. The number of particles in a closed region can change. New particles can be created out of matter and particles can out of energy and particles can annihilate to make energy. Particles can appear and disappear, but electric charge, net electric charge can't. A positive and negative charge can appear. That's still zero net charge. A positive and a negatively charged particle can come together and annihilate. The matter goes away, but there was no charge to begin with, so there's still no charge. The net total amount of charge in a closed region can't change. And charge, finally, is quantized. It comes in discrete little amounts. It was Robert Millikan in 1909 who discovered the fundamental charge. It's given the symbol E. Since this is a quantitative course, we will be using that symbol, uh, E, for the, ele the fundamental charge. Uh, we now know that the fundamental charge is actually a third of E, and that's the charge on the subatomic particles, sub-subatomic particles called quarks that make up the protons and neutrons. They actually carry charges of one-third and two-thirds E, positive or negative. Electrons carry charges of exactly E, or minus E, actually, and protons carry charges of exactly plus E, in, even though those particles are dramatically different. Uh, the SI unit of charge, we've been dealing in this course in the International System of Units. The SI unit is the Coulomb. It's got a fancy definition in terms of forces between current carrying wires and things. But basically, I like to think of one Coulomb as about 6 times 10 to the 18 elementary charges, 6 times 10 to the 18 E. That's a rough figure, but that's what, how I think of charges. It's a certain number of elementary charges, a big number, because elementary charge is pretty small. So that's the electric charge. Now, I indicated that like charges repel and opposites attract. That implies there's a force involved. And we, being quantitative here, would like to quantify that force. We'd like to understand how to calculate that force. And we'd like to understand how that force acts between individual charges and maybe even between groups of charges. Why is that important? That's important because, as I suggested when I said my arms don't fall off because of the electric force, most of the interactions that occur in our everyday world are interactions involving fundamentally electric forces. When DNA replicates, the DNA molecules that intertwine in the twisted helix, the molecules, the little parts of those molecules that get together, electric charge is making that happen. When you put your clothes through the washing machine, the properties of the soaps you use have electric charges on particular ends of molecules, and that's what pulls the dirt out of your clothes. Electric charge is everywhere, so we want to understand how electric charges interact. We want to understand the electric force quantitatively. So let's take a look at the electric force, and then let's do a little demonstration, and then we'll really get quantitative with it. The force between two charges, two electric charges, depends, not surprisingly, on the two charges. If you have two objects that are completely uncharged, completely uncharged, I'll emphasize that, then they don't experience any electric force. If they have zero net charge, they may or may not experience an electric force depending on whether that net charge is made up of several positive and negative charges. We'll get to that shortly. 
It also depends on how far apart the two charges are. So the farther apart they are, the weaker the force. And it depends on the inverse square of the distance between them, which should ring a bell because back in lecture 13, we saw that the gravitational force also depends on the inverse square of the distance between masses. And the direction is such that likes repel and opposites attract. Let's pause and do a quick demonstration of that. Over here, I have a, a couple of aluminized balloons, and they are connected by thin wires to this device here. And since I'm going to be using this device several times in the next few lectures, let me just explain you what it is. It's called a Van de Graaff generator. It's one of the earliest devices that was actually used to power early particle accelerators for the study of elementary particles. Not in use anymore because it can't make high enough energies for today's studies. And what it consists of, it's basically uh, similar to what happens when you shuffle your feet on a rug and walk across the floor and touch a doorknob or something else metal and you get a shock. What's happening is you're pulling electrons off materials, you're building up a charge on yourself and you touch something else and charge leaps from you to that metal object and you feel the tingle of a shock. This thing works the same way. It's got a belt inside this transparent plastic tube. The belt is being driven by a motor, and the belt is in contact with some felt cloth. It, it pulls electrons off that cloth. It transfers them up to the top of the belt where some metal brushes near the top of the belt, uh, the electrons jump to those metal brushes, and they're connected to this big sphere. And so the sphere acquires an electric charge. And here I have these two balloons also connected to the top of the sphere, again by conducting wires. And so they are going to acquire a charge also because charge will flow along those conducting wires. So let's do a demonstration of that. I'm going to simply throw a switch to turn that belt on and you see the balloons moving apart. There's clearly a force involved there and that force is in this case a repulsive force because the charge on the balloons is the same because they're connected to that sphere. If I try to push one balloon toward the other, the other balloon goes away because there's a force. And I'd like to understand quantitatively the nature of that force and how it depends on things like the distance between the balloons, the charge on the balloons, and so on. So I'm going to turn this off and just to be on the safe side, I'm going to discharge it with another electrode that I've connected through the wiring of the building to the ground. There it goes. And that discharged, and now the balloons have come together because there's no charge. So let's look further at the nature of this electric charge. So it depends, as we said, on the inverse square of the distance between the charged objects. Um, the direction is such that opposites attract and likes repel. And mathematically, the electric force is described by Coulomb's law. And here's Coulomb's law. So we'll do one of our anatomies of an equation with Coulomb's law here. Take a look at what this law is telling us. This is named after Coulomb. I want to emphasize that both Coulomb and Priestley were involved in discovering the physics behind this. So on the left of the equation, we have the force between two charges, which I've labeled Q sub 1 and Q sub 2. It's negative if the force is attractive, positive if it's repulsive. There are the two charges. You can see how we get the attractive and repulsive because two Numbers with the same sign multiply to make a positive. Two negatives multiplied together are positive. Two positives multiplied together are positive. Positive means the force is repulsive. A negative and a positive doesn't matter which is which. Uh, multiply them together and you get a negative number and that indicates that the force is, uh, is attractive. And finally, the square of the distance between the charges appears at the denominator of Coulomb's law. So that's Coulomb's law that describes the electric force between charges. And uh, Coulomb's law requires some kind of constant in there. The force is proportional to the product of the two charges, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In the SI system of units, the constant has the value 9 times 10 to the 9. And if you work it out, it's Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. That's what it's got to be to cancel the two Coulombs, Coulombs times Coulombs with the charges and the meter squared in the denominator, and that gives us a force. I want to emphasize that number, the value of the Coulomb constant in this particular unit system is an artifact of the human unit systems. Uh, the value of that constant in relation to some other constants is more significant, as I will show you shortly. Let me uh, do a little comparison here with gravity, because we've already dealt with the gravitational force back in lecture 13, and there's some similarities here. First of all, they're both proportional to the inverse square of the distance between the objects. But here's a big difference. There's only one kind of mass, whereas there are two kinds of charges. 
because there's only one kind of mass, gravity is always attractive. There are two kinds of charge, and the electric force can be either attractive or repulsive, and that makes for an enormous difference. And here's another big difference. The electric force is fundamentally much, 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 much stronger than the gravitational force. And being quantitative, let's take a look now on the big screen at how we understand that quantitative difference between gravity and the electric force. So let's begin with two protons. Here they are. They're some distance r apart. What's r? Well, it turns out it doesn't matter. The reason it doesn't matter is because both forces behave the same way with r. Both depend on the inverse square of the distance. So between those two protons, there's going to be a repulsive electrical force, which I've labeled F sub e. By the way, I didn't point out, but the, you'll notice that the electric force obeys Newton's third law. Uh, it involves q1 and q2, and it doesn't matter what order they're in. And so uh, multiplying those two together gives the same force regardless. And so the force is on, of charge Q1 on charge Q2 is the same as Q2 on charge Q1. And I've indicated that here by drawing vectors of the same length. Uh, those are different force vectors because they have opposite directions, but they have the same magnitude, just as Newton's third law says they should. So somehow Coulomb's law knows about Newton's law. There's also attractive gravitational force between those two protons because they have mass. And all masses attract all other masses. So I've labeled that F sub G. I've indicated that it's smaller by drawing a shorter arrow. Uh, it's actually much, 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 much smaller. So much smaller I couldn't draw it to scale on here. And let's do the quantitative calculation. Turns out that the mass of a proton is about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Protons are not very big. Not very massive. They carry one elementary charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The electric force, we just saw, is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, where K is that coulomb constant, 9 times 10 to the 9 SI units. Uh, I've put E squared here for the Q1, Q2, because both protons carry the elementary charge E, so it's K, Q1, Q2, K, E times E, K, E squared over R squared. The gravitational force, as we saw back in lecture 13, is G, the big gravitational constant, times the product of the things that are interacting gravitationally, that is the two masses. In this case, it's simply the square of the proton mass, M squared, and that's divided by R squared also. Same R in both cases because it's the two protons that distance R apart. So let's look at their ratio. The electric force divided by the gravitational force, that's Ke squared over R squared. The electric force divided by the gravitational force, Gm squared over R squared. Put them like that. The R squareds cancel. And we have Ke squared over Gm squared. We've got everything we need to calculate that. We've got K, we've got E, we've got M, and we've got the gravitational constant that, which is rather small, you'll notice, in SI units. It's not the same units as the Coulomb constant, but that suggests already 9 times 10 to the 9 plus 9, 10 to the minus 11, that there's a difference in the strength of those forces. Put those together, and you get a difference, a factor of 10 to the 36. So the gravitational force between two protons is smaller than the electric force by a factor of 10 to the 36, an enormous number, a 1 with 36 zeros after it. So... How can we understand that huge difference? I mean, we worry about gravity all the time. We worry about falling. We look at tall buildings. We climb mountains. Uh, we worry about gravity. We feel gravity. Gravity pins us here to Earth. How can it be that gravity is so uh, weak and the electric force is so strong, and yet we don't seem to notice that. We think of the electric force as sort of a minor thing. We, we see two socks clinging together when we take them out of the dryer by static electricity. That seems to be a minor thing. How is it that gravity seems significant and the electric force doesn't? Well, take a look at this picture. I've shown two pictures of Earth. In one picture, uh, I'm looking at Earth electrically, and Earth contains... Ultimately, protons and electrons, positive and negative charge. And partly because the electric force is so strong, those protons and electrons come together to form basically neutral objects, like, for example, atoms. So Earth is essentially neutral. It isn't exactly neutral, by the way. It carries a very small negative charge. But it's basically neutral. So even though Earth has a lot of electric charge in it, it has zero net electric charge, or very nearly zero. And so it has no large-scale electrical effects. On the other hand, there's only one kind of mass with gravity. There's not two kinds of mass. Even antimatter has positive mass. Not that there's antimatter in Earth to any significant extent. 
One kind of mass, that mass is only attractive and so large agglomerations of mass come together and even though gravity is fundamentally very weak, the weakest of the fundamental forces, nevertheless, Earth's gravity, or the gravity of large accumulations of matter, becomes quite strong. So that's why, ironically, it's precisely because the electric force is so strong that we don't tend to notice that. Okay, let me move on. I want to make one important point about all this business about the electric force between two charges. I've strictly speaking been talking about the force between two tiny infinitesimal points of charge, like electrons and protons. It turns out Coulomb's law also works if you have spherically symmetric distributions of charge, balls of charge of any size. But when you begin to get into more complicated shaped objects, what you have to do is look at the interactions of all the charges that make up those objects. Charged objects are called charge distributions, and I want to look at some charge distributions. There are simple charge distributions. The hydrogen atom, for example, consists of a proton and an electron, but more common are complicated distributions of charge. Here are some pictures. Molecules are charge distributions. Your computer memory is a distribution of two electrical conductors, and when they're charged, it says, yes, one, there's information in that memory, zero if they're not charged. Your cell membranes are charge systems. Printers and copiers use electric charge to fling um, uh, point charge droplets of ink at the, at the uh, paper. Thunderclouds are charge distributions. The sensor in your camera that captures an image involves electric charge. Antennas are distributions of charge. So is your heart, as we'll see shortly. Batteries, atomic nuclei, soap, as I mentioned, works because of the distribution of charge. Electric power lines are distributions of charge. Let's take a look at how we deal with distributions of electric charge. Suppose I raise the question, suppose I have two electric charges and I want to know what force they exert on another charge. So here's a picture. We want to know what the force Q1 and Q2 exert on Q3. And so electric forces, in fact, add. And they add vectorially, and you might say, well, um, is that in fact the case? Do they add vectorially? It sounds obvious. That's actually not as obvious as you'd think. The electric force from charge Q1 added to the electric force from charge Q2 gives the net electric force on Q3. That's not as obvious as it might sound. In fact, for gravity, under the general relativistic theory of Einstein, things don't work quite that simply. But they do in this case. And that's called the superposition principle. So there's the force that charge uh, Q1 exerts on charge Q3. It's repulsive because they're both positive. There's the force that charge Q2 exerts on charge Q3. It's attractive because Q2 is negative and Q3 is positive. There's the distance we use in Coulomb's law to calculate the force of charge 1 on charge 3. There's the distance R2, 3 we use in, Newton's law, in Coulomb's law to calculate the force on Q3 from Q2. We know about adding vectors. We take vectors, we add them head to tail, and we come up with the net vector. And there is the net force that charge Q1 and Q2 together exert on Q3. And we'd want to know that kind of thing because we want to understand how charge Q3 is going to respond in the vicinity of charges Q1 and charge and Q2. And so let's do a more quantitative example of that that will give us some insights into how these charge distributions work. So here's a simple charge distribution. I'm going to start with two equal charges Q, and I'm going to ask what force they exert on a second or char third charge, capital Q. And clearly, they're all positive. That's why they're red. That's my sign for positive. There's a force F1 from the left-hand charge, which I'll call Q1. And there's a force F2 from the right-hand charge, which I'll call Q2. And those forces are equal in magnitude, but they have slightly different directions because of the orientation here. And they're going to add to give a net force, something like that. And the net force is going to be vertically upward in this case because of the symmetry of the situation. Well, how do we handle a problem like this? The first thing we do is establish a coordinate system. So I'll put the charge on the left at minus a, and the charge on the right at x equals plus a. This will be my y-axis. Uh, the force, the net force, is clearly the sum of the y components of these two forces. Their x components are in completely opposite directions, and so they cancel. So this is what's making this problem a little simpler. And let's get into some mathematics. Charge q is going to be a distance y up the y-axis. The individual charges are a distance a, along the x-axis from the perpendicular bisector here. There's some angle which I'll call theta here, and it's equal to this angle by 10th grade geometry. By the Pythagorean theorem, the distance from either of these charges to charge Q is the square root of A squared plus Y squared. That's a right triangle. So there we go, and we have what we need now to calculate the forces. Uh, F 
2, F1 acting on Y, F, that's this force, and uh, F2, the Y components of them are K, little q, big Q, divided by the distance squared, and then to get the Y components, the part in the vertical direction, we multiply by the cosine of the angle. Cosine, remember, is adjacent over hypotenuse. So let's work that out. Cosine theta, adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, the adjacent side is y, that's adjacent to the angle theta. The hypotenuse is square root of a squared plus y squared by the Pythagorean theorem, so that's what cosine of theta is. So let's put that in our equation for cosine of theta, and we get k, big little q, big q. Uh, there's r squared, r squared is the square of that square rooted thing, and then there's the cosine of theta. Well, that looks complicated. Let's work on it a little bit. There's our result. We're going to simplify it just a little bit. I have upstairs in the numerator k, q, big Q times y. I have downstairs a squared plus y squared times the square root of a squared plus y squared. That's the same as a squared plus y squared to the one-half power. So I can write that whole thing on the denominator as a squared plus y squared to the three-halves power. And I want to make this point. If I plot that, complicated function, it looks something like this. The force between them would be zero, on Q would be zero if Y were zero, if it were right there. As I move away, the force gets bigger for a while because the relatively strong forces are pro of the two small Qs are producing a fairly large force on the charge big Q. But as I move further away, that one over R squared fall off begins to take effect and the force falls off. And that is an example of a complicated, fairly simple, but still complicated charge distribution. And it shows that the 1 over r squared behavior applies only, in principle, to point charges, little individual points of charge. As soon as you get a complicated distribution, you can have other ways in which the force depends on distance. Now, we can get a very important insight from looking at this example. So here's our result from before, and now I want to ask the question, what happens if we move these two charges, small q, close together, or equivalently move big Q far up the axis, so this distance y becomes very large compared to the separation of these two charges? So what if y becomes much, much greater than a, using the mathematical symbol there for much greater than? So here we've seen what happens. We've symbolically moved the charges Q closer together. Uh, the distance A has become smaller compared to the distance Y. These angles have become smaller. Uh, the force is already more in the vertical direction. What happens? Okay. Well, first of all, the quantity A squared plus Y squared in the denominator becomes approximately just Y squared. A becomes much smaller than Y. A squared is that much smaller than, than Y squared. And we can ignore um, A squared compared to Y squared in the denominator. Uh, equivalently, uh, this diagonal distance has become approximately the same as this distance now as that angle shrinks down. But Y squared, we're just going to have Y squared downstairs. Y squared to the 3 halves is Y cubed. And consequently, the force becomes simply 2kqqy over y cubed. The whole denominator became y cubed. And now I've got a y upstairs that can cancel one of the y's in the y cubed downstairs. And so the force becomes 2kqq over y squared. And I've grouped the 2q together because this expression ought to look very familiar. It's the Coulomb constant k multiplied by the value of some charge. In this case, the charge that's the sum of those two charges, the net charge, in other words, on this system, the, third, the second charge that's being acted on, and a 1 over r squared fall off. So what this is telling us is that this system is now acting like a single point charge 2q, located maybe here, maybe here. It doesn't matter. Those distances are so small. So if I were to plot this expression, our original expression, and then plot this new expression, I would get the 1 over r squared fall off of a true point charge field. And what this is telling us is that this complicated charge distribution, if I get pretty far away from it, and here's the distance 3a away, 4a, 5a, those two curves become indistinguishable. Its electric force is the same as the electric force, essentially, of a point charge. As I move in closer, then the complicated structure of the charge distribution becomes evident, and these two forces become, uh, become different. And in fact, the force of the two charges, when they're, far, when they're far apart as Q moves downward, actually goes back down to zero at, uh, when Y becomes zero. Now, what is this telling us? It's giving us an important insight. It's telling us that when we have two, uh, a complicated system of charges, 
any charge distribution, doesn't matter how complicated it is, as long as it's got some net charge, if we go far away from it, the force due to that distribution of charge begins to look like a point charge with that distribution's net charge, provided that charge is non-zero and that the distribution is of finite extent. And let me just give you an example here. So on the left, I have some kind of charge distribution, maybe a little negative on the left because it's bluish, or more positive on the right. And I have two charges I'd like to calculate the electric force on that distribution from. The force in Q1, that would be very hard to calculate. I'd have to consider all the different directions to all the different charges that make up that big Q. It'd be hard to do. But the force on Q2 would be easy. It's approximately K big Q, the total charge on that messy looking object with charge on it, divided by that distance. What distance? To the center, to the edge, it doesn't matter because that distance is so big compared to the size of that charge distribution. So a very important generalization is a system of charge looks like a point charge if you're very far away from it. And we can summarize what we know about charge with that and the earlier things we learned. So electric charge is a fundamental property of matter. There are two kinds. It's conserved and quantized. Coulomb's law describes the force between two point charges. The electric force obeys the superposition principle, meaning we can vectorially add that. And if we get really far from a charge distribution with non-zero net charge, that thing resembles a point charge and then we can very easily calculate electric forces.